Hello, this is Adam with Gwinnett County Public Libraries. Today, I would like to introduce you to Go, the world's oldest continuously played game, and arguably its most complex. Go originated in China some 4,000 years ago, and today still has nearly 50 million players worldwide. Although most Go players today live in China, Korea, and Japan, its popularity has exploded in recent years here in the West. In this video, I'm going to teach you the absolute basics of this wonderful game, and then talk a little bit about the game's history. And if you're interested in trying this game for yourself, at the Snellville branch of Gwinnett County Public Libraries, we're holding an event on Wednesday, May 25th, 2022, for you to come and try the game for yourself. If you're interested, please follow the link in the description, or visit GwinnettPL.org to register. All you need to play Go is a bowl full of black stones, a bowl full of white stones, and a grid to put them on. You play Go with two players, one person taking the black stones and the other taking the white. Each player takes turns placing their stones on the grid one at a time, and the goal of the game is to claim the most territory on the board. We'll talk more about territory later, but to put it simply, you can think about the stones that you're putting down as the borders of a future country, and the goal of Go is to make sure that your countries get the biggest. One of the really cool things about Go is that there are actually three different board sizes, each of which significantly alters the pace and complexity of the game. For this video, we're going to be looking at the smallest board, which I recommend sticking to if you're a complete beginner. But do just be aware as you're learning that there are two boards bigger than this, and normal Go games are played in the largest. If you're used to playing other strategy games like chess, there may be a couple of things here that may take some getting used to. For starters, in Go, the board starts off completely empty. The only thing you can do on your turn is place one stone of your color anywhere you want, and once that stone is down, it doesn't move. You've probably noticed by now that while I'm placing these stones, I'm placing them on the intersections of the grid, rather than in the empty spaces. This is often the weirdest thing for people to wrap their brains around, but don't worry, you do get used to it pretty quickly. You can even put your stones down on the very edge of the board, or here in the far corners. You can put them down anywhere there are lines intersecting. So, with what we just learned, let's play out a quick game. Now while we're looking at this one, keep in mind that a game would never ever play out this cleanly, but we're just looking at this for demonstration purposes. You can see that right now in this game, black is kind of hemming white into this corner, and black is taking everything else. At the end of the game, all of the empty space contained within or behind your stones, or, in other words, within the borders of the little countries that you're making, is your score. So all of this belongs to black, while all of this belongs to white. Without even counting, it's pretty obvious that black has already won this game. There's only one other twist to go, and that is that if your stones are completely surrounded, then they become captured. Captured stones are removed from the board and set off to the side. At the end of the game, you get to add all of the enemy stones that you've captured to your final score's bonus points. Let's take a moment to take a deeper look at how capturing works. If I place a stone on the board, you can see that it has four empty spaces around it. We call these empty spaces liberties. So our little stone here has four liberties. When counting liberties, we count the empty spaces that are up, down, left, and right of a stone, but not diagonal. If two or more of your stones are connected, then they become a group, and they actually share their liberties with one another. So this group of two stones has six liberties, because it has one, two, three, four, five, six empty spaces around it. If I make an L-shaped group like this, then we can see that it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine liberties. In other words, it basically just has nine spaces around it. Since liberties are only the empty spaces around a stone, if that space becomes occupied, then the liberty is taken away. Say that we're playing black, and white, our opponent, has surrounded our poor little stone here on three sides. Our stone has now been reduced to just one liberty, since there's only one empty space remaining. With one more move, you can see the white plays here. Now our stone has zero liberties, and any stone or group with zero liberties is captured and removed off the board. When I was first learning to play Go, I found it helpful to think of my stones as little critters. 
Just like little critters, our stones need access to air, and if they become completely boxed in, then they're going to suffocate. This same principle applies to a group of stones that are touching one another. Let's look back at that L shape we made just a moment ago, and let's say the white has managed to almost completely surround it. White has reduced this group to just one liberty, since it only has one empty space here at the top. If white plays one more move up here, then now this entire group is at zero liberties, and it's all captured at the same time. Let's look at another example. Say that we're still playing black, and white, our opponent, has again surrounded our poor little stone on three sides, reducing it to just one liberty. There's actually a word for this position. Atari. Yeah, like the video game company. If a stone is in Atari, that means it has been reduced to just one liberty. In other words, it can be finished off with just one more move. It might be helpful to think of Atari as check from chess. Atari basically just means if you don't do something right now, then your opponent has an opportunity to kill your stones. Since our stone is in Atari, we should probably do something to help it. In order to save this stone, we can play here, thus extending it outwards. Now, these two stones together have one, two, three liberties. Now, it'll take at least three more moves for white to finish surrounding this. We have saved our stone. Well, at least for the moment. In Go, there is an important concept called life and death. A group of stones that are alive are invincible, and they are impossible to capture, while a dead group of stones are fated to be captured, even if they haven't been already. See, there's a minimum shape you have to be able to make with your stones in order to make them alive. If we look at our board, this white formation of stones here is called an eye. Let's say that we're black, and we've made an eye here, but white is surrounded it on the outside. Thankfully, since our group still has one liberty, in other words, one empty space, here in its center, these stones have not yet been captured. But all white has to do is place a stone right here in the middle of our eye, and now our entire group is taken off the board. As we can see, making one eye by itself not particularly helpful. But, if we have two eyes, then there is absolutely nothing our opponent can do to our group. Let's take a look. In this example, we have two eyes, and white has surrounded us on the outside, reducing us to just two liberties. Now, if white tries to play in the middle of either of these eyes to fill in the liberty, then we still have one more liberty to work with, and our group is still alive. And now, you may be looking at this board and noticing something. White stone has no liberties, and so the moment they put it down, it becomes captured by us. In order for white to capture our two-eyed group, they would have to be able to play in both of these eyes at the same time, which is impossible since you only get one move per turn. So any group of two eyes, or the ability and space to make them any time they want, is invincible, and we call these groups alive. Conversely, if an area of the board is too cramped for a player to make two eyes for their stones, then their capture is inevitable, and we call these stones dead, even if they technically haven't been captured yet. The heart of the conflict in Go is both players trying to make two eyes, while at the same time doing their best to take eyes away from their opponent. Often, there's simply not enough room on the board for both players to make eyes for their groups, and the fights that erupt from these areas of the board are called life and death problems as you and your opponent are both wrestling to give life to your stones and to kill your opponents. Life and death problems are little puzzles unto themselves. Many East Asian newspapers even have little life and death problems in their puzzle sections, which require you to find a sequence of moves that'll keep a group of stones alive. Each of these little life and death problems can have the complexity of a game of chess, and part of what makes Go so complicated is that there can be a dozen of these conflicts happening on the board at any given moment. And these conflicts aren't isolated, as each of them spreads out across the board, they begin to interact with one another. The outcome of one can significantly affect the outcome of another. This creates so many variables and possibilities that any single move has a kind of butterfly effect all the way across the board. A game of Go, therefore, is almost impossible to play with logic alone since you can't read that far ahead through that many possibilities. No human being can read out the profound effect that just one stone is going to have on the next hundred moves. It's this quality that makes it so that Go is one of the last games computers were able to really master. 
It wasn't until as late as 2016 that Google managed to develop the first artificial intelligence that could compete with a Go professional. Go, unlike a lot of other strategy games, relies a lot more on experience and intuition than it does logic or analysis. Once you really get into it, you'll find that a lot of your best moves weren't the ones that were carefully planned, but the ones that just felt right. And with that, I think that you now have more than enough to play your first game. Before we move on, let me leave you with a famous Go proverb. In Go, you really don't know what you're doing until you've lost your first 100 games. If any of this seems confusing, it's not just you. Go is a really difficult game to wrap your brain around. But once you get into it, it's an extremely rewarding game to learn. So go on, get out there and lose your first 100 games. Now that you understand a little bit about Go, it might surprise you to know that almost nothing's changed about how the game's played in the last few millennia. Scholars argue over the game's origins. Some speculate that the stones and grid may have originally been used as a counting tool, similar to an abacus. One Chinese myth claims that the game was invented by an ancient emperor as a tool to teach his son philosophy and discipline. The most likely origin of Go, however, is that it was a tool for divining the future. In ancient China, just like the ancient Mediterranean, it was common for a prudent general to try and see the future right before an important battle. One of the ways this was done in Greece, for example, was by reading where in the horizon lightning strikes were taking place. One way this was done in ancient China was through mathematical diagrams called magic squares, and some believe that go boards were actually ways to lay out these diagrams. Whatever reason that the ancients had for throwing around black and white stones, at some point in the second millennium BCE, some three to four thousand years ago, Go transformed into a proper game, and its popularity spread like wildfire. In China, Go came to become one of the four pillars of aristocratic culture, right alongside painting, calligraphy, and music. Around 1500 years ago, the game began to spread to Korea and Japan, and by the year 1000, Go was already an integral part of Japanese culture, as evidenced by its presence in all the works of Murasaki Shikibu. If you ever read something like The Tale of Genji, people are playing Go practically non-stop. For most of their history, Go was the favorite pastime of China, Korea, and Japan. In Japan, Go's popularity exploded again at the beginning of the 17th century. After Japan's reunification under the Tokugawa shogunate, the new government set up four Go houses, which were dedicated to playing and teaching Go, and which competed against one another in so-called castle games, tournaments held in castles all across Japan. Although there were four houses, there was one that stood above all, the Honinbo House, to which most of Japan's Go masters owed their allegiance. When you became the head of one of these houses, you took on the name of your house as a title, and received a special name to go with it. For example, one of the most famous Go players to ever live was Kuwabara Torajiro. When he became head of the Honinbo house, he was thereafter called Honinbo Shusaku. In the late 1800s, Japan undertook a concerted effort to westernize, and Go, for a time, began to lose its popularity. As Japan westernized, three of the four Go houses were dissolved. Only the Honinbo house survived the 1800s, and it lasted until 1940, when Honinbo Shusai, the last head of the house, at last dissolved it too. Today, the title of Honinbo is still in use, but rather than having any affiliation with a prestigious Go house, it's simply a title the Japanese players compete for annually. As of the release of this video, the current Honinbo is Iyama Yuta, who has been Honinbo since 2012. And with that, this video draws to an end. Thank you so much for listening. I know that this is a lot to wrap your head around, but I hope that you've gotten enough out of it to start your own Go journey.